So we'll go ahead and get started. And if other people trickle in, that will be great. I'm Colette D. Phelps. I'm with the University of Idaho Extension. I'm located in Moscow, Idaho. And my position is an area educator, and I serve the northern part of Idaho. Um, in that capacity, one of the things that I do do is work with farmers markets, and I'm a member of the Moscow Farmers Market Commission. And this summer, I did a lot of work with the market in terms of doing rapid market assessments. Today, I'm going to talk to you about what a rapid market assessment is. And then I'm going to use the data from our Moscow Farmers Market Assessment as a case study to show you some of the types of things that you can learn doing an assessment. And then I'll conclude by just talking about some other ways that I've used DOT surveys. So it would be really helpful to me if you could just quickly go around and introduce yourself and say what interested you about this particular session, and that way I can try to touch on that in the presentation. I'm Kate Painter. I'm with you about extension down in the county, and I want to get some ideas for using this in my farmer's market. So. I'm Hilary Spoda. I'm with the Spokane Conservation District, and I deal with all things marketing, advertising, so this is uh, I'm Jess Harden. I'm with Organically Grown Company in Portland, and I honestly was just wanting to see what the dots were. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. I'm Sandra Stern. Um, I'm with PDQ Farms um, in the Villa near the Yakima, and I was thinking it was more about developing other kind of markets because we don't really do much with farmers markets, but who knows? Maybe this uh, will still get something that would. Stuff out. Okay. okay. Um, I'm Whitney and from the Spike Farm in the Spokane area. I work for a nonprofit and I also run with a small doodle of my own. Um, but we use uh, things like this um, for the nonprofit that I work for and I'm just interested in making sure that we're doing it correctly. Okay, great. I'm Jim Schrock from Urban Eden Farm. We're about five minutes that way next to Whitney. And uh, I helped do one of these at the Spokane Farmers Market maybe eight or ten years ago, and I thought it was seemed kind of useful. I, I kind of did my part to kind of foul it up a little bit by asking too many questions. But I'm opening a farm stand this uh, this spring, and I thought it might be helpful to to uh, ask some of the same questions just for my own thing. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it is a tool that you can use in multiple ways and to look at change over time. And that's one of the things that we're going to do today is to look at some changes that have happened in the Moscow farmers market over the last seven years. So I started doing rapid market assessments in North Idaho and with the Spokane market in about 2003. And so there's some great data out there if you're ever interested in looking at things that how they've grown over time. Rapid market assessments are really a low cost way to gather information that is important to farmers market managers, boards, and vendors. And it's designed to be a two-way learning environment because the host market learns important things about the market. But you bring together a team of people that actually conduct the rapid market assessment that also get to learn about the market. And so that's a win-win for both parties. And it's really fun for customers. Most often when you're at a market, your customers really want to feel engaged. And so if you do a rapid market assessment and you're like, can you take a second to help out the market today? They get really excited about it. And then they'll come back and look at the data and engage in conversations with you about what you like about the market or what they like about the market and what they would like to see changed or how they see that the market could be improved. And rapid market assessments are a combination of three data collection methods. One is doing an attendance count. The other is the dot survey that happens. So both of those are quantitative methods. And then there's a qualitative method piece that we'll be talking about, which is called constructive comments and observations. So I'll go through each one of these in depth. This is a method that was developed by Larry Lev 
with his colleagues Linda Brewer and Gary Stevenson from Oregon State University. And there's actually a publication that goes into more detail about how to use rapid market assessment in a farmer's market setting. It's a free download from their catalog and this is the address. For those of you that have come in a few minutes after I started, there's a sign-up sheet going around, and if you'd like a copy of my slides, just put your email on there, and I will email them to you. Also, I am going to be showing some numbers that might be a little bit hard to see from the way back, so feel free to move up if we um, get to that point and you want to be able to read them a little bit better. So key to having a successful rapid market assessment is that you have a really good team. And you need to have a team leader that understands how to conduct a market assessment, that is going to work with the market manager and the board to identify what type of questions need to be asked, and who's going to work with the volunteers to train them in their specific roles within the assessment. So that team leader is really responsible for preparing all the materials for the assessment, and overseeing the integrity of the process and writing the report. Um, in conjunction with usually the market manager, that team leader also recruits the volunteers that come and do the assessment. And it's ideal to have people that are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations or vending at the market as part of that team, because what you really want is you want fresh eyes on the market. You also are in a situation generally if you're running a market that you don't have time to do a survey so you can bring in a team and that team can do some great work for you. Also you can pay that back by going and doing an assessment of their market and then perhaps getting really good ideas of what you could bring back home. So that's part of that two-way learning that I talked about. So in addition to looking for other vendors or market managers from the region, you can also call on your extension professionals or other food and ag professionals at the Moscow Farmers Market Assessment. I had um, the director of the chamber from the Moscow City. I had another faculty member from geography, which was really interested, that was excited about the market, another one from business, and some other people that were involved in different aspects of the local food environment. So when you put a team together, it's really important to be clear about what their commitment of time and roles are. And one of the things that people really do need is a pre-RMA orientation to what those roles are to kind of explain these are the three pieces of the rapid market assessment and your role is going to be X. Because when you have people on site, you're going to have people that would be doing attendance counts. You're going to have people that are going to be re recruiting people to actually do the DOT survey. And you want everybody on your team to go through the market and do the constructive comments and observations. What I found is that that recruiting of people to come and actually do the DOT surveys is not something that everyone can do physically or can do for the duration of a market. So I'm pretty flexible on how I put people in their different roles. But when it comes to attendance count, I try to keep the same people in the same position throughout the day. And I'll talk about those roles as we go through each piece. So attendance counts are really important in understanding the growth of your market over time. It can be something that can recruit new vendors because when people are assessing different markets and they have a lot of options of where to go to, they might want to know who are your customers, how many do you have. It documents the social value, the community capital that the market brings by the number of people that utilize that for both um, a place to buy goods, but also to have community relationships. And when you combine it with the quantitative dot poster data, you can estimate sales within and outside the market. And that's pretty important economic information. And I'll show you exactly how we do that. So for attendance counts, it's pretty simple in terms of equipment. Like I said, this is really low cost. And if you ever want to do one of these types of assessments, you can email me. I'm happy to share my tally sheets, which you would just need to modify. So you need tally sheets. You need clickers, which are right here, just like those little sports clickers, and clipboards and pens. And then what you need to do is you need to do a reconnaissance of the market and identify every entrance to the market. 
And so with many markets, you have very defined entrances, but then you might have gray zones like you see in this market. This is actually the one sky, one earth farmer's market on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation in Plummer. And so while there's direct entrances at both ends of the market, you can also have people coming through the sides. And so when you identify what your zones are, you're going to have people not only, only counting who's coming in at the main entrance, but you're going to give them a zone. So they're saying, OK, I'm going to mark from here to that to that second booth. And that if I see anybody pass through, I'm also going to count them. And that's going to give you a clear count. So you start with an opening up count of who the customers only are in the market. And then you have one piece person at each entrance. And I use a 10 minute count, which works really well for our market. If you do a 20 minute count, it's actually going to be more accurate. But most people do do a 10 minute because you have a certain size market team and there's other roles that they need to do during that time. So our market starts at 8 a.m. So we do our market counts at um, 25 and 35 after the hour. If it started at 8.30, we'd probably start those counts at 9. So it's really midway in the hour. For the estimated spending, you need to count only the adults that are entering in the market. And you don't want to count people that are re-entering the market. Um, and then because you're counting for 10 minutes at a specific entrance, you can multiply that by six and get an estimate of the number of people that came through that entrance in that hour. So as you can see um, in this tally sheet at the bottom, we actually have five counts, one an hour for our market based on the length of our market. And our initial count that we did this summer, we just did adults. And then talking with the market manager and our RMA team, we said, well, there's a ton of kids at the market. Maybe we want to know how many kids are at the market. We do a lot of children's programming. And you know, that's another um, group of people in our community that find a lot of value in the market. So we actually ran a two-clicker system for other counts that we did. And I'll show you those outcomes later this year. Um, later in the presentation, but then we had to also figure out how we were going to make sure that people didn't confuse their clickers. So we had one on a lanyard, one not on a lanyard that had a dot. So when they came back to record, it was really clear what those numbers were. So this is showing you uh, data from the Moscow Farmers Market uh, July 28th of this year. And so we took all of that data, well, I took all of that data from those sheets. And then I estimated the counts by hour, which is what you see at the top. So at the opening, we had 314 people in the market. And then we had a little over 1,600 people enter in the first hour, 2,000 the second hour, 2,600 the third, 2,000 the fourth, and then about 1,400 the last hour of the market. And with that, we, could, we also looked at each entrance to the market and what the use was in terms of people entering at each place in the market. And this information is pretty important to the market manager and the Mar Moscow Farmers Market Commission because we're really looking at design and flow within the market. And we're also looking at the placement of vendors. And so as you can see, we have this Fifth Street um, entrance that about 17% of the people came from, which is right next to our food co-op. But that's a place where some of our vendors don't really feel like they get good visibility in terms of you know, who is coming into the market and are concerned about their sales. So this helps us understand you know, what kind of visibility they have when people are entering the market into some other areas. And as we do long-term market planning, we'll be looking specifically at that street and how to make sure that that street is highlighted so those vendors um, have good customer count. Um, so another thing I want to point out here is on the top is that we estimated for this particular day in the market that there were um, over 10,000 adults that came to our farmer's market. And that was a real eye-opener. Eye Nobody knew that we had that many people that came to our market. So as I mentioned, we had done a rapid market assessment in 2011, also the same Saturday in July. But at that time, our market was in a different location. It was in a parking lot that was adjacent to our main street. And over the course of the last several years, 
we had a lot of conversations, moved the market to Main Street, which, you know, if you move a market, it's always controversial, even if you're moving a market literally one block. But what we found is that we've had a lot of strength and growth in our market, and we've had some changes over time. But we wanted to know, you know, how can we compare? So we, are compa we compared both attendance counts, and we kept the same questions in our overall market assessment that we did in 2011, so that we could compare, you know, question to question, same response categories. So what we found is that our estimated number of adults increased by 53%. Uh, so by 4,753 adults. But our peak customer times remain the same and that our highest customer times were still between 10 and 11 a.m. So we almost had a doubling in our adult customers. So we wanted to see if, you know, our attendance was pretty consistent throughout the summer. And one thing that's important to understand about rapid market assessments is you are getting data from one point in time. And while we like to generalize data, we really need to gather data from a couple different points in time to kind of feel confident. Maybe there was something else going on in our community that spiked the numbers on that particular day, even though we tried to pick a weekend that was you know, average for Moscow. So on August 11th, we just did a customer count, not another full rapid market assessment. And we found that, again, we had over 10,000 adults. And that's when we counted children. And we had over 1,700 children in our market. And then we did a third count in September. So Moscow is a university town. So in the summer, we're getting people that are living in Moscow coming into our market, plus a certain amount of tourism. But a lot of people and students come back in September. And so we said, well, let's look at what's happening in September. Are we going to see a big spike or something that's very similar? And we saw that, again, we had just over 10,000 adults in the market, and we had about 1,200 um, children. And so, it's, so we feel pretty confident now in saying that we have a good 10,000 per week on average customer base in our market. Does anybody have any questions about how the customer account works or our comparison between markets? Uh, the No, we don't do it every year. You could do it every year, though you are going to get some fatigue by your returning customers unless you figure out a way to make it compelling, like maybe showing them la last year's data and kind of creating an annual event out of it. So there had been another assessment in 2013. There had been an assessment in 2011. There had been an assessment in 2009. And then I think the one before then was 2003. So. One of the reasons that we decided to do this assessment this year, besides looking at the change in the market over time, is we have an economist with the university who does an economic impact um, assessment of our market. So looking at the overall economic impact for Moscow and Lataw County. And this data is really important for that study. And he wanted to update that study So the next piece of the rapid market assessment um, I wanted to talk about are the DOT surveys. So with DOT surveys, you have four questions and you have four posters. And you know sometimes when I'm working with a the market, they want to have five questions or they want to have six questions. And I'm really like, no. You only have so much time that you have from your customers. And you don't want to create fatigue and have a real drop off in the number of questions. So we found Four is a really easy amount of time. People see it. It looks doable. They'll stop even when they're pretty busy and um, actually answer your questions. So usually questions are closed-ended, meaning that you have a question across the top and you have equally spaced columns. And within those columns are your responses. So for instance, um, What's the primary reason you came to the market today? You have agricultural products, crafts, prepared food, socializing. If you decide that you want to have an other column and you're going to have pens available, you really need to have somebody staff that. 
and be able to make sure they facilitate that open-ended questions. I, I try to discourage open-ended questions as much as I can, especially if you can imagine like working with 10,000 people, it's really different. If you're in another market that maybe has 100 customers that come, that's a very different way of being able to converse. Um, everybody gets four dots, one dot per, per question, or you can say one dot per poster. And then the key thing is it's one dot per shopping group. And a shopping group are the number of people that are um, shopping out of one wallet. And that can be roommates can shop out of one wallet, families can shop out of one wallet, but we have to ask people. And so in addition to saying, could you take a minute to do the dots or help out the market, when you hand them the dots, you have to make sure that they're doing that one, that one shopping group because that impacts your ability to do some of the economic analysis of the spending that's happening in the market. Um, one of the things that I've also done, which is really helpful with people with small children, I have a color of dots for adults because adults are your shopping group, whether they're you know the 16-year-old adults that are shopping or, or older, but I have a color for children. And so when I ask an, a parent, and if you're a parent, you know that it's kind of crazy to try to do something when you have your children. And then I'm like, and you guys can do it too. I don't actually count the children's dots because I'm not being consistent about recruiting children. I mean, I could if I had a question that was really pertaining to kids. But that gives them something to do, and it becomes a family activity. And families actually really like that. They stand there, and they have a whole conversation with their kids about what is it that they like about the market, or why did they come, or if they have some of their own money, how much do they think they're going to spend at the market today? So it's pretty fun to watch. Um, all your posters have to be prepped before the market. At the Moscow Farmers Market, I know I'm going to have a lot of responses. Like we had over a thousand people that responded to our survey at the market. And so I planned that we would change the poster every hour. And so it was all prepped on, on the flip chart. I had everything ready and I had times on the posters before I got there because you can go so fast that you can forget to actually write a time and then you don't have accurate data. So as much as you can do beforehand, that's great. Um, some people are worried about influence, like, oh, there's going to be, you know, so many people said they came for crafts, and so people are going to be like, well, I don't want to say I came for egg products. We don't really see that, but you can see the posters if you want to start out with a certain number of uh, dots on them that are in some type of scattered pattern. If you do that, you just have to count. And I also use one color for adults and one color for children. Because um, people, if you have multiple colors, they get hung up on like, well, what does the color mean? And it just, you know, it's pretty to have multiple colors, but I've gone to just having one for each. Um, as I said, I changed um, mid for this market because there's so many people. I change every hour for other markets. It might be first um, half of the market and second half because there's not so many people. And you do want to have like a robust visual attraction of those dots. So the questions are really developed with a market manager in the board. And they're really supposed to address what's most urgent on the mind of the market. In uh, 2013, like the Moscow Farmers Market, there was a big debate about dogs in the market. So that was one of the reasons that a rapid market assessment was done at that time, was to get really timely feedback from uh, market patrons about whether or not they wanted dogs in the market. And in the end, we don't have dogs in our market because it was not something that there was a real high demand for in our market. But because we collected the information from the people coming to the market, it made it much less politicized to make that decision. Because in Moscow, we love our dogs, and um, it is a concern. What are your numbers? Are you counting? Oh, yeah. So this is how I count when the sheets come off. So as I said, this is the blue are kids, that, which is kind of interesting because they came for the crafts and the prepared food and the, to socialize. Uh, but I actually go through when I count, and I just write a number on each sticker to make sure, because I'm you know, counting over 100. Yeah. And it, you know, some people put a dot, but I found like this is faster and more accurate because there's a lot of hours in counting. So 
that's what that is. Thanks for asking. Um, in designing the questions, sometimes, especially with money, I might have like seven response categories, but I try to really narrow down those response categories. As I mentioned before, to avoid bias, to keep the different um, columns uh, equally spaced versus like, I know ag products is gonna be the number one reason that people came to the market, but I'm not giving that column more weight. So I'm not biasing the responses in that way. Some people do do that. I just choose to change the posters more often and avoid that bias. Um, when you have your questions, you want to order them, the four questions, logically. I start with the ones that are the least sentence sensitive. I don't start with how much are you going to spend in the market today? Because that's, you know, asking people how much they're going to spend is like some of the most sensitive things that you can ask them. So I start out with like, what's your primary reason for coming? Everybody likes to tell you why they come to the market. Where do you live? That's really important for understanding economic impact because we know if they're from within the community or outside. And then I move into the, the more sensitive financial questions. So here's some examples of questions. I talked about primary reason for coming to the market. Um, another question that a number of markets I've worked with have wanted to say, um, what else would you buy here? Or you can be very specific. Would you shop at the market more often if there was dairy available or if there was pastured poultry? And that helps the market d decide whether or not they might be changing their rules to allow something in the market that they don't already allow or recruiting specific vendors. Um, what uh, one change would you recommend to improve this market? This is one where we work with the, the market manager and board to brainstorm as many categories as possible, but you would probably have another because people are going to come up with other things. Where do you live? You can do that by zip code. You could do that if you're in a bigger city by neighborhood. Um, you can do it by city. That's really something that you have to figure out based on the scale that your market serves. And then when you do something like how much have you or will you spend in the market, generally you go like 0, 10, 20, you know, like that. But if somebody puts between, um, you know, 20 and 30 on the line, that becomes 25 because they're really telling you I spent $25. So you can get a few more responses. So. Um, this is from July. We asked what the primary reason was for people to come to the market. And for over half of the people, uh, it was agricultural products. And socializing was about a quarter of the people, prepared foods 10%, and then music and crafts uh, 4 and 5%. And this is really important because a lot of markets struggle about what their balance is going to be between their agricultural products and their crafts. And this, you know, crafts are important and they are attractive, but they're not the primary reason people come to a farmer's yeah. market. And so this can really help when a lot of debates come up about what the balance is gonna be when you, and maintaining that as you want your market to grow. And what we really believe in Moscow, and I've heard from other markets as well, is that 50% of your vendors at least need to be agricultural if you're in a farmer's market. Otherwise, it starts to tip over into a craft market, and that's really not what the customer is looking for. They're, they're looking for a farmer's market. So for us in Moscow, when we're considering whether we're going to grow down to the next city block, because we have a really robust market, the number of people attending, but also this emphasis tells us if we're going to grow, we really need to grow our agricultural products sector. Um, and so, what we saw with our change in location, which was interesting though, is that we have more people coming for socializing than we used to have. So a 13% decrease in the number of people that came primarily for ag, but we saw that really primarily tip over to people that were coming for socializing, which actually makes sense because we have an environment that is much more conducive to socializing now that we closed down Main Street and we're outside of a parking lot. And so, uh, so that was that was nice, and that also helps the market feel like, yeah, you know, that money that we spend on 
children's activities and the money that we spend on the music or the entertainment, the cooking demonstrations, that's money well spent because a lot of people are coming to our market because that is a value to them. We also asked where people live, and so uh, Moscow is in Laytaw County. So we have a little bit more than half of the people that came to our market on this particular day that lived within Laytaw County. But we had a lot of people that were coming out from outside the area. And the reason that it was really important for us to distinguish between those in Laytaw County and those outside is because when we want to look at economic impact, the way we we look at that in calculating economic impact of the market. If you are within the um, geopolitical boundaries that that market serves, which for us is Laytaw County, and you're buying your produce there, that's not necessarily showing that the market has an economic impact because the assumption would be if you weren't buying your produce at the market, you would still be buying your produce at a grocery store or at the co-op and so you're still spending the same dollars within the same community. But if your market is drawing people out from outside of your community and they're spending money at your market, then that's economic impact because those are new dollars coming into your community. And those are, are what we measure for that economic impact. There is a little bit of a difference in terms of economic impact for in in county spending, if you're really getting down to the price difference that people are paying, so maybe they're paying a little bit more to buy something at the farmer's market, so there's a little more spending. Or if you go one level deeper and they're buying from farmers, but those farmers are using local services. So this is where you start to get into those multiplier effects. But primarily we're looking at new money coming into the county. And you know, it might be new money coming into the city, depending on what your boundaries are. So we really didn't see a lot of difference between 2011 and 2018 about, um, too, not too much about where people live, how many from outside of the area, and the like. The real difference was in the numbers, the, just the overall quantity of people. So then we asked about how much they, um, have you or will you spend at the market today? And that's because we're just catching people when they're walking by the posters and they're centrally in the market. Um, some people are like, oh, I, I'm gonna keep this because I'm gonna go shop and then I'll come back and put it on and others are just estimating. So again, this is one, one day in the market, a lot of estimates. So um, remember I talked about shopping group and each shopping group is you know, having one dot to say what they're spending out of their wallet. So this is where I'm gonna to start to do math, and so if this is confusing, let's just go over it again. I'm happy to go over how we do these calculations multiple times. So what we do is we essentially, based on the number of people that said they'd spend $5 or 10 or 15, we multiply that by the number of people that answered that question to get, you know, how, essentially how much was spent in the market. So our survey respondents said that that day, together, the, all the survey respondents spent a little over $24,000. So to know how much the shopping group was or the basket that they had, the average basket size, you divide that by the number of respondents to that question. So is that making sense? You know, I, I'm adding up, you know, all of the numbers in terms of what was spent. I'm dividing it by the number of wallets or shopping groups that spent that. And then the average that we got was $23.38 for the overall of the market. Then I went back and I looked at just the number of people that were spending in the morning half, so ten, eight to 10 which interestingly as well as when most of the agricultural products are bought is in that, that time period, which I can also see by looking at the dots in a different way. But I can see that people in the morning are spending a little bit more than people in the afternoon. So, so when we um, look at this, we can use that number, which is an average spent, with our attendance count to 
estimate the amount spent in the market. So we have to do one more um, qualifier when we do that. We have to estimate how many people are part of that shopping group. Because you know, I'm using the data from the survey to get what that basket size is. And then I have to say, okay, well, how many people were shopping out of that one wallet when I'm looking at the total number of people that came to the market? So, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't develop these numbers. These are, are Larry Loves from OSU's, what he says are safe estimates. So a very conservative estimate is that for every two people, came, two people coming to the market or shopping out of one wallet. So that's where you get the shopping group size of two. Um, a less conservative uh, estimate is 1.6. I would say in our market that we're probably not at two. Maybe, you know, maybe we would use 1.8 and be a little bit more accurate, but we used in our calculations the high and the low. So on the low end, when we say, okay, a shopping group size is two, we take the number of people, the total shoppers, we divide it by two, we have about 5,000 shopping groups. We multiply that by the basket size of 2338, and we get that the in-market sales are approximately 117,859. So that's the low end. The higher end is a little bit over 147,000. So that's the range of what the spending in the market was for that day. So with that, we know that about 48% of the sales were to people that lived outside of Lataw County, which I, because 48 of the respondents lived outside of Lataw County. So we can estimate that the new money coming in on this particular morning to Moscow being spent in the market to these vendors is between 56,000 and 70,000. And then the economists that we're working with will take those numbers and do multiplier calculations to show overall what that economic impact is. Any questions about those numbers? Because I know it's a lot of numbers. Yes? How many vendors uh, do you have and how many are egg vendors? Uh, we have 100 vendors and approximately half are egg. So at least 50% of our vendors are eggs. Sometimes, depending on where you are in the season, it can be a little bit more, a little bit less. So when we compare 2011 and 2018, what you see is that the average basket size increased by 17%. So people are, on average, spending 17% more. more. And, um, what we also saw is that the total market sales increased 122%. So they more than doubled. So our market grew a lot in those seven years. So we also asked people about how much they planned on, um, if they planned on doing any additional shopping in downtown how much they anticipated spending. And this is important because this is where we start to talk about the economic impact of the market outside of the vendors. And when we moved downtown, it was really controversial to a lot of shop owners. They felt that when the streets got closed off and they lost the parking lots in front of their shops, that the market was um, essentially having a negative impact to them. I don't think now we would interview any store that says that that is the situation, but it was definitely a concern when we moved. And so what we found, you know, essentially doing the same type of calculations that I explained in depth is that we have between $65,000 and $80,000 that is, are being spent by our market shoppers in the downtown on Saturday morning because the market is there. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty big bonus. And if you've been to Moscow, you would see that we have a really strong downtown. So if you put all of this together, not only are people shopping more, you think that our downtown has 10,000 people a week that are seeing our downtown businesses. And just that visibility and acknowledgement that the businesses are there are probably influencing people coming back and shopping at those businesses outside of market hours. And um, 
again, we saw an increase in downtown spending that it was about 110% increase, so downtown spending doubled. So what's really interesting, though, is that the amount of per shopping group did not increase. It actually decreased by less than 1%, but we just have so many more shoppers that the economic impact is bigger. So while we saw more people spending more inside the market, we didn't get information that people are spending more outside of the market in the downtown corridor. So that was a lot about numbers. Does anybody have any questions or comments about the number side of things? So Moscow has about 27,000 people. And that's, that is in the school year when we have our college students present. So our population declines in the summer because a lot of people travel and the students, most of the students are gone from the university. So a huge, a huge market for a relatively small town. And because our, our Saturday market is so strong, there are not, you know, we try to draw from Lataw County first in terms of our vendors and then kind of concentric rings, but up to 200 miles from the market, you can come into our market if what you're bringing in is something that local producers don't have or more. So we really dominate the market in a way that other towns cannot host a Saturday market. You, you need to go as far as Spokane and Coeur d'Alene before you get a Saturday market. Like Lewiston, which is 35 miles south of us, could not compete with this market. And so we have a couple other weekday markets, but this is really the market that dominates for Saturday. Are there any other questions or comments? I want to check my time, but I don't have a time piece. Could you let me know where we're at? Okay. 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 Great. Um, let's see. Sorry, I think I'm going the wrong way. Okay. There we go. Okay. So the third part of a rapid market assessment, as I mentioned, is constructive comments and observations. And we ask people to look at the market through four lenses, looking at the vendors and products. And so that's like the diversity of products, um, how people sign and display their products, um, the quality of the products. So it's anything about the vendors and the actual product mix. And then looking at the physical site, how is the market laid out? Some markets like the Kootenai County market in court, um, that's just north of Coeur d'Alene, they have booths that are designed. Um, so everybody has a unique design, but the materials are all the same. So there's certain layout and certain things about that physical site. You know, um, one of the comments in our old location for Moscow is when we were in that parking lot, that a problem with the physical site is that we are on the backside of restaurants and there were dumpsters there and those dumpsters did not smell good. So that was part of the physical site. Um, Atmosphere, that's really what the vibe is of the market. What's the energy of the market? How are people, how do you think people are feeling? Um, is, it, is it a really welcoming place to be? And then general public comments is really having your ear to the ground and listening to what other people are saying. And when you're doing a rapid market assessment, Sometimes um, you might be soliciting information in your, your conversations, but oftentimes you're overhearing people as well because you just start really paying attention as you walk through the market. And we try to keep these comments in the positive, like what is it that you appreciated out of the market and what are some of the changes or improvements that are needed? Um, so what you supply to your, your team are pre-printed sheets, one per observation, you know, clipboards and pens. And if you have people that are very familiar with the market that are doing this assessment, you want to use different color sheets. So when we did our market assessments, um, we did have some commission members from the Moscow Farmers Market Commission that wanted to do that. So I actually made their sheet a different color so that people that weren't as closely associated with the market, we could understand what their perspectives were and what commission members' um, perspective were, perspectives were. Because you don't want to mix the two, especially when one group is a decision maker about the market. 
And all the observations are done during the market and people just turn their sheets in at the end. Um, those sheets are part of what goes into the report for market managers and board members. And so, as I mentioned before, the team leader prepares the report. And what you see on this physical site side here is that each one of those sheets, um, there's kind of general everything you can put in terms of what you observe. But then we ask everybody to say, what's one, what's one thing that you want to say is your most important message to the market? And so, as you can see here, I have community members on the top and then what Farmers Market Commission members said to keep that straight. So, in doing my report as well, if there was anything that was very specific to a vendor, like one vendor, I would not have included it in the written report. I would have made note of it on the side, probably had a verbal conversation with the market manager about it. But this is something that becomes a public report and so, we're talking about general things and you don't want to have anything in there that, um, you know, would call out one vendor above others positively or negatively. And uh, all of the different um, tables that I showed you or the graphs, those are actual things that I generated and put in the, in the reports. And so the first thing to do is to re review that report with the market manager and um, with your team members and then to revise it and finalize it and to do a summary presentation. And, you know, this is a lot of information and so um, it's really helpful to do an executive summary because some people just can't take in all that numbers and all, all those complexities. <laughs> So does anybody have any questions about the process overall for doing a rapid market assessment or comments? Sure. How, how many uh, markets do you think do market assessments? What percentage, I mean, hmm. or at least around here? At least every two to four years. I, I don't know that. I can't. I can't say I don't. I do know that a few do them, but I don't think that they're done regularly, probably, unless you have somebody within Extension or another organization that has that expertise because management of markets does change. Kate, would you think that would be different in your experience? So S Stephen Peterson is the economist in the College of Business that works with us to do the market impact assessment. And as I said, he's going to take these, um, the spending inside and outside of the market coupled with a second assessment that I didn't show you the data from that we did in September that asked the spending within the market where people were from. Um, and then we also asked in that one what their spending was in Moscow, not in downtown corridor, but more generally in Moscow to see if we get any other information about greater spending. Because if you have 48% of your people that are coming to your county for your market, you can probably guess that they're doing other things than just downtown. And so what's the impact outside of the downtown corridor? And when we put that together, we really talked about like how much can we refine this and actually get good data. And I, um, I think it, it's problematic, even we did decide to ask that outside of Moscow, but it, it becomes problematic, one, because we asked two months earlier in the downtown corridor, and it just takes a bit more explaining, and you, you really don't know what assumptions people are making when they're, when they're actually giving you that data. Um, but we decided to go ahead and give it a try. So. Um, you can always email me if, if you'd like a copy of my report that I pulled this information from. I'm happy to share that with you. And then probably in January or February on the Moscow Farmers Market website, there's going to be a complete economic impact assessment report that's updated using this data. And so um, on an annual basis, the last time one of those assessments was done, the economic impact of our market was the the conservative estimate was over $3 million and the high estimate was over $8 million. 
And when our uh, city council saw that, that totally validated their investment in our market because our market is run by the city and they had been paying for a half-time market manager. And they were really wondering, was that a good investment? Should we raise vendor fees? Should we really be hosting the market? There is no question among our elected officials that we should have that city investment in our market and they actually made the market manager position a full-time position after they saw that because they could really justify that um, the market was a very good investment. So this can be really powerful information in terms of getting support from your for your market and you know our reports can also be powerful for you in other communities to talk about what the value of investing in farmers markets is and if you're looking for more support for your market you know, this one has grown over time, it's 40 years old, so it's been a long time to get where it is, but it's always been a very strong market. So some of the other ways that you can use these dot surveys, um, definitely for needs assessment, I've used them, you know, in Lataw County, our uh, fairgrounds was considering whether or not they wanted to put a shared use commercial kitchen in a Grange building. And so I did um, dot surveys at the farmer's market, I did them at the county fair, and I did them at a local food festival. And it wasn't just a way to get information about whether people thought we needed a kitchen and how they might use it. It was a great way to have a conversation about what a kitchen is and what that might bring to our community and even like what type of equipment they would like to see in the kitchen. And there was a really um, strong demand and a lot of enthusiasm for that. And so that kitchen is going in. And this, this is not the only information that had people decide to put that kitchen in, but it definitely um, was put in the mix for that investment by the fairgrounds in this situation to remodel a building and put in a shared use commercial kitchen. Um, this particular snap piece is at the market and it's a dot survey with working with kids about tastings. I've also done this type of dot survey with kids in schools doing different local foods tastings and having them be able to share the results about what they like or what they learned. I've used it in terms of event evaluation like our small farm conference and uh, um, to also get feedback on what different kinds of programs people would like to see or topics covered in the future. And then I worked with Steven Peterson this summer to take a version of using these dot posters to the Centennial Trail, which runs through Coeur d'Alene. They were trying to figure out like what is the impact of that trail, like how many people come from outside Coeur d'Alene specifically to use that trail. And so we developed a, an assessment at different points in the trail to um, gather that economic data. So the one qualifier I would put out there in terms of any of the economic impact assessment is that you really need to be working with an economist that understands the numbers and what they're doing. This technique was developed by an economist, but also really working with one to make meaning out of the numbers and be able to talk about them in a very valid way. So for instance, um, you know, sometimes people would want to say, well, for the farm, for the Moscow farmers market, that the economic impact is, you know, it's really $117,000, which is the total sales in the market for that particular week in July. Well, it's really not. It's really more around 50 some thousand dollars because it's the sales that are coming in from outside the community. And so it's important to really understand the difference and make sure that you're using the data in a way that's clearly conveying what's going on in terms of your market or whatever asset that you're looking at the economic impact of. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. And does anybody have any questions or want to throw out an idea about how they might use this technique or questions, you know, like questions that you might ask? Anything like that? Do you have any idea how you could use this on your current markets that buy from you to find out what other things they might like? You mean working, like, tell me who your current markets well, are. So, so we're selling to these different um, co-ops, and we're thinking, well, maybe we'd like to grow some other things, too. But I 
I'm just wondering if this would, it would be a, an easy way to survey them to see what they'd like to see grown. Or would it be even better to try to survey their customers? I think I would use it to survey their customers. Right. So with the Moscow Food Co-op, I haven't used this to survey customers about specific products, though it, it would be easy enough to do with, within the produce section or right outside the store. We did use it as a method to do um, data gathering for the co-op strategic plan, which you know our co-op really emphasizes buying local seasonal products. So I would suggest that, yes, it could be used to go into some department about something that, um, what is it that your customer wants to see in terms of other products that could be grown locally? You just really have to work with your um, retailer to do that. But it would be a good assessment technique, which could also provide that retailer with some information and um, impetus. Um, there are some questions which are in that publication that I talked to you about that do ask how much more might you pay for something. So that in terms of like a retail survey, I could see the value of saying, you know, if, if the cost of this product is X from, you know, California or out of the area, would you be willing to pay X amount per pound more for a local product or that type of um, sensing of what your market could bear in terms of price points. Are there other questions or ideas? Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. Again, if you'd like a copy of the presentation or you're interested in receiving the report that I referred to, um, there is a sign-up sheet that might have made it to the back by now, so if you would just uh, put your email address on that before you leave, I'll make sure you get those. So, thanks again.